Neil Stevenson published The Diamond Age in 1996, and I read it when I was in high school. I was hooked on the ideas of nanotechnology and post-scarcity that were presented in the novel. Now, I'm Dr. Peter Allen. I earned my PhD in bioanalytical chemistry in 2008. I went into my field in some ways because of this science fiction novel. Now, there's a TED Talk that has been aired in the interim where Andrew McCaffrey goes through major world-changing events like plagues and the rise of religions and the fall of empires and concludes that none of that really mattered very much. He says there has been one story, one development in human history that has bent the curve, bent it just about 90 degrees, and it is a technology story. And I'll link to that in the description. I'm not so convinced of that hypothesis anymore. I mean, surely in some dimensions, like the ones he shows, population and social development indices, yeah, maybe, and maybe on a century's time scale, but on a lifetime scale or a decade scale, I think other stuff maybe matters more. But when I was a fresh-faced young college student, I would have agreed with Andrew McAfee 100%. It makes sense looking back that I love this novel because that's definitely the position of this book. The Diamond Age is about that, about technology that's going to change the world, that's going to bend the curve, but it's also about how it's played out in the dysfunctional, political, individual lives of the characters. The plot. The book starts with a birthday present, an extremely advanced, pseudo-intelligent book really a computer nanotechnologically enabled to be disguised as a book and they call it the young lady's illustrated primer or the primer for short the book's purpose is to educate a young woman from elementary school all the way through apparently graduate school including everything from reading lessons and the alphabet all the way through programming a Turing machine from scratch and the nuts and bolts operation of the matter compilers, the nanotechnological 3D printers that can make almost anything in the world of the Diamond Age. Now, a few young girls get the copy of the primer and eventually become accomplished professionals. The stated purpose of the primer is to help young women grow up to lead interesting lives. And they do. In the end, they go on to do remarkable things, to maybe even change the world. As all of this is going on, we're getting introduced to a world of diamond airships and steampunk-themed augmented reality parties, rollerblading thugs with stainless steel nunchucks and firearms implanted into their skulls. It's a vibrant world, and it's all based on something that we might call Drexlerian nanotechnology. What is Drexlerian nanotechnology? The book's gives us this window into what people's lives might look like in the context of advanced nanotechnology. Neil Stevenson was influenced by a futurist named Eric Drexler, who wrote The Engines of Creation in 1986 and founded, co-founded the Foresight Institute. You can get a reasonable idea of where this is all going from watching Richard Feynman's lecture, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, from 1959. So you can kind of see how the progression went, right? Feynman gives this lecture on just how much you can fit into a tiny space in 59, and then in the 80s you have Drexler and the Engines of Creation, and then the 90s we have the fictional The Diamond Age that is inspired by all of this apparently futuristic but serious thought. And what does it all come down to? It comes down to how might we 3D print atoms into molecules and molecules into objects? And if we could do that, if we had that much control over matter, what would life look like? As a quick aside, 3D printing of atoms is how it's presented in the Diamond Age and even in the Engines of Creations, even how uh, Richard Feynman talks about it. But that's that's not really how it's going to work. If we ever get to molecular nanotechnology, it's not going to work by a sort of pick and place 3D printing mechanism that's just ah, an unrealistic picture of how it works. But like, as a thought experiment, it's fine to get you the ideas of what this might do someday. There's this amazing debate between Eric Drexler and Richard E. Smalley, the winner of the 1996 Nobel Prize in Chemistry and the discovery of Buckminster Fullerenes. I'll put a link to that as well. But in that debate, they go through in depth why the 3D molecular pick and place idea is is just it's not a realistic picture 
if you want me to go through that, I think that'd be really interesting. Leave me a comment uh, and I'll, I'll think about doing a whole long, deep dive on that debate. It is a uh, great piece of pre-internet public intellectual shade throwing. Anyhow, however it ends up working in practice, the hope is that for molecular nanotechnology that we would have arbitrary molecular level control over the construction of things, anything, any object, any size. And that idea is super exciting for a science fiction novel. Like carbon is really cheap. It's in the air we breathe. And as long as you have energy and the ability to put it into whatever shape and chemical arrangement you want, well, you could build anything out of carbon into diamond, essentially. Carbon nanotubes could make extremely strong cables, fabrics, conductors, could make diamond windows, tools. The title of the book, The Diamond Age, actually comes out of this idea. Carbon materials are so central in this imagined future, they call it the diamond age because diamond's cheaper than glass. And so diamond becomes the working material in this age, the way stones were in the stone age and iron was in the iron age and it's not crazy to think nanotechnology really could enable really amazing big projects things like space elevators become reasonable if you have control over matter at that level if you could get there by some other mechanism computers could be ultra miniaturized vastly more powerful than we have Computing with the flow of electrons is crude compared to the use of nanotechnological push actions, diamond nano rods. This could be efficient and avoid the problems that come with quantum mechanical weirdness where electrons begin to tunnel through neighboring circuits when they get down to the nanometer. So lots of that kind of idea comes into play in the fictional diamond age. A sword has an edge like a chainsaw under the electron microscope and can cut through steel like butter. Vast underwater habitats, synthetic nano coral islands, airships with lifting envelopes full of hard vacuum instead of helium. Nanotech might make all of these things, but it could make ordinary stuff like food and clothes and kilometer tall apartment buildings. Basic needs can be met essentially for free in this world, like like the replicator in Star Trek, except except it's owned and operated by imperial capitalists called the Neo-Victorians or the Victorians or the Vickies, if you want to be offensive. And I think when I was young and I read this, I thought if we had a matter compiler and everything could be free and ubiquitous, we would transition to post-scarcity. But on reread more recently, the fact that everything could be free and ubiquitous doesn't necessarily mean that it will. Right? Utopian post-scarcity is not the vision that this book presents. And I'm starting to resonate with that skepticism more. In the book, there are people who own the matter compilers, people who program the compilers, people who trade service for access to the products of those compilers. Right? Just because it can make everything for everyone for free doesn't mean someone doesn't want to profit. If someone doesn't have connections or talents, if they don't have a compiler of their own or a feed, then they need to work for people who do have all that. And some people can live off of charity. You could go to the local compiler and get some basic food or clothes or a blanket, but, and, and people do end up living in shelters, subsisting on all those free concessions to basic human needs, but it's an ugly life. Those are not pleasant places. There's violence and drugs. And for anyone who wants to escape, there are Predatory lenders offering easy and temporary ways out, followed by forced labor and debtor's prisons. I wanted to be a nanotechnologist. I wanted to make some small contribution to ending material scarcity. Maybe material needs could be satisfied by nanotechnology, but I'm starting to see things less like I saw Napster in the early 2000s. And starting to see things more in terms of artificial scarcity. And that's not a problem that's going to be solved by technology, no matter how advanced, because we do it to ourselves. Anyway, this dystopian book feels like how we might really use such post-scarcity technology to maintain an unjust and unequal society. An in-group might enforce artificial scarcity in order to 
coerce subservience. The in-group who gets to have never-ending luxury and then an out-group who can clean their toilets. Yes, post-scarcity technology could engineer a self-cleaning toilet, but this book presents a vision of the idea that maybe people would want other people to clean their toilets. They want somebody in a maid outfit to clean their house, not because that's the best way, but because it's satisfying of something we have deep in ourselves at some <sighs> darker level. Anyway, it's it's not as hopeful a book as I thought it was when I was young, but I'm still I'm still excited by the possibility that we might be able to use technology to make life better, if not for this generation, then maybe some down the line. I ultimately side with McAfee. I think that there's no other way to improve the human condition than to make abundance more possible. So thanks for listening. Uh, we will see you next time.